Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this wonderful world of ours. How's everybody doing? Hope you got your coffee or your tea. <laughs> uh, this is day six, so this was yesterday, and it is the closing arguments. I think I'm going to do this in a two-parter. We're going to cover the prosecution's closing, and I've been going through it, and it is juicy i think it's this attorney she's good she's just bam 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 just nailing it i mean nailing it and we're gonna start out with um looking at tim ferreter and the judge uh, asking him if he's going to testify in his own defense or not. And let's get right into this. we got a lot to cover. And I am going to play a lot of this um, prosecution's closing arguments, and that's why I'm going to do it in two parts, because it is so good. I was looking. I'm going to start hers at probably about at, at one th an hour and 30 minutes, so I'm going to cut out like the first five or ten minutes because she's going over jury instructions and what they should do. Now, she does that in these other parts, but where I'm going to start it is where it just starts getting into the nitty gritty. And that's what we want to see. We want to see her hammering these facts and 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 this kind of stuff. And it, it got really good. I was like, whoa. And I just let it play. Um, I might stop it a few times, obviously, and comment. But other than that, we're going to let it play out, and then I'll do a part two for the defense's closing argument. I think instead of just having one super long, we, we can do two parts and everybody get a break and not, not fall asleep. But definitely you won't be falling asleep through this prosecution's closing arguments. So here's Tim Federer being asked if he's going to um, testify or not. Here we go. Let's do this. The issue of the defendant testifying or not and the court doing the necessary colloquy on that. All right, so Ms. Murad, um, to, um, I know we talked about it already in the context of the jury instructions. Uh, this is a more formal um, um, addressing of that issue. Uh, has your client made a decision in this case as to whether uh, he will testify on his own behalf or not? He has made a decision, Your Honor. And what, what is that decision? Okay, so let's hand the mic to Mr. Ferreter. Mr. Ferreter, if you could start off by, you can be seated if you'd like, sir. Uh, go ahead and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? I do. All right, you can put your hand down, sir. Go ahead and state your name and date of birth, please. Tim Ferreter, 41775. All right, and you read, write, and understand English, sir? I do. And what's your highest level of education? College degree. All right, are you under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or other medications this morning? I am not. Have you ever been treated for any mental or emotional condition? I have not. All right, and just to give you the context of why I'm conducting this colloquy, uh, as you've heard, your attorneys advised me that you've made a decision whether to testify or not. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, I need to make sure that that decision is being made by you knowingly and intelligently, freely and voluntarily. So that's where these questions are intended to go to, to put me in a position where I can make a factual finding on those items. You understand all that, sir? I do. All right, and um, you're represented by your attorneys, uh, Ms. Murad and Mr. Wahid, in this matter? Yes, sir. And are you satisfied with their services? I am. All right, and they've, have they done everything that you've asked them to do regarding the presentation of your trial and consideration of whether uh, for you to testify on your own behalf or not? They have. All right, and have you had a full opportunity to discuss with your attorneys uh, the pros and the cons and the risk and the consequences of testifying versus not testifying in this matter? I have. All right. And have they um, uh, fully advised you of all those risks and consequences as far as you're aware of? They have. And have they been able to answer all of your questions regarding the various pros and cons, risks and consequences of testifying or not? They have. All right. Has anybody, including your attorneys, made any promises, threats, or tried to force you into a decision this morning that would be against your will? No. All right, so the reason I ask that is, and you've heard some of this from me before, there are basically three things that a defendant absolutely controls in a criminal proceeding. And what I mean by that is, although you can receive the advice and counsel of your attorneys, 
ultimately, I don't look to your attorneys to tell me what the decision is. I look to you to tell me what your decision is because your decision is what governs. Those three things are, one, whether to plead guilty or not guilty, two, whether to go to trial or not go to trial, and three, whether once you are in trial, whether to testify in your own behalf or not. Obviously, you've already made and gone past two of those decision points, continuing with your plea of not guilty and also continuing with the decision to have a trial. So now we're at that precipice where I told you we would arrive at uh, one day once the trial were to begin as to whether uh, you should uh, make a decision to testify on your own behalf or not. Um, there are certain consequences that I do want you to be aware of if um, you were to testify on your own behalf. Um, uh, and one of those is that you uh, will be subject to cross-examination by the defense. The only way the defense ever can have an opportunity to cross-examine you in this case is if you take that stand there and you subject yourself to direct examination by your attorneys, then that opens you up to cross-examination by the state. You understand that? I do. All right. Another area is that you have any felony... Yeah, he don't want to be cross-examined by the state. Oh, my God, would that have been awesome. Damn. Damn. Probably he does not want to be cross-examined by them. Man, would that have been juicy. Convictions or uh, misdemeanor convictions involving truth or dishonesty, they could also bring that out. Now, is the, does the state have anything like that that it would potentially bring out against Mr. Ferret if he were to testify? No, no. All right, so that's not a real worry. It's a worry for a lot of defendants that come before me, but it's not a worry in your case because you have no history. So um, the real risk is that you're opening up yourself to cross-examination by the state. Um, based on the colloquy that I've given you thus far, do you have any questions of the state uh, of the court about anything I've discussed or explained to you this morning? All right, after this colloquy, do you feel like you need to take any additional time to speak with your attorneys regarding the decision that I'm going to ask you to tell me in just a moment? No, thank you. All right, have you made a decision in this case whether to testify on your own behalf? I have. All right, and what is that decision, Mr. Ferreter? To not testify. All right, based on the court's colloquy of Mr. Ferreter, sir, I find that you're making the decision knowingly and intelligently after having had the opportunity to receive the advice and counsel of your attorney. I also find that I've explained to you the potential risk and consequences uh, of um, testifying in your own behalf on the stand, including the fact that you would subject yourself to cross-examination. Um, based on all that, I find that uh, you're also entering into this decision uh, with an appreciation of those risks and consequences and that you understand the same and that your decision is being made freely and voluntarily. So I accept your decision not to testify as having been knowingly and intelligently, freely and voluntarily made by you. So that conclude, concludes the colloquy on this matter, sir. You may give your attorney yeah. back to Mike, and thank you, sir. Oh, my God. Would that have been... All right. Um, been we are set serious, to... Serious, serious spark flying if that, if he would have testified. And let, let me tell you, that's probably the best advice his attorneys could give him. <laughs> like, oh, bruh. You, we're suggesting you should not testify, because <laughs> good Lord, that prosecution would have just shredded him, shredded him. I will be putting this link in the description, so if somebody wants to go and watch the whole thing. Now, I had skipped maybe 10 minutes of her opening, because like I said, she's going back and forth, pointing at the jury instructions and what it means to where she can uh, point out evidence that conveys the, the particular how it's worded in the jury instructions. I'm going to start at uh, one hour and 30 minutes, which she started talking at about 118, about an hour and 18 into this. So, And she's going to dive in with some mental illness and stuff. And I'm probably just going to be letting it play and then just comment here and there because it it's good. She does a phenomenal job. Now, the judge has to get on her a few times about grabbing the mic, but but other than that, guys, buckle your seatbelts, grab your coffee and some, some snacks, because it's good. I, I thought this was really good. We do not have to prove to you that his confinement was 24-7. There's been a lot of discussion about, well, there were times where he let he was let out. 
Absolutely. The state agrees and agrees. His sister agrees. That has always been what they have said, what they have discussed about what happened. To They're going to I noticed that they were bleeping out the kid's name. If you're wondering why there was a little dip in the uh, audio, it's they're bleeping out their the, the children's names to him. It's not every moment of the day. There are lots of times where they look like an ordinary family. It's what happens behind the closed doors, which is why we're here. We do not also have to prove that the victim was starving, that he was malnourished. That has never been our contention or the state's claim. Uh, we agree that he was not clinically malnourished. The issue with the food is that they systematically controlled and regulated him to an extent where it became abusive. There was social isolation. There was lack of access. There was lack of autonomy to a level in which it was objectively harmful to any person, but specifically to... That's why the food matters. Yes, he got dinner. He got breakfast most days. You can see on the video there's one or two days that as a punishment he does not get dinner. But we sat here and watched him over and over and over again eating meals alone in his room. It also is not a legal defense that a child has some type of diagnosis, a mental health issue, a substance abuse issue, a behavioral problem. You know, whether or not a child is born with a mental health issue or an intellectual disability or a behavioral problem or an adopted child has those things because of trauma, because of genetics, because of a roll of the dice. That could happen in any case, adopted or biological. That is not a reason or a justification to abuse a child. And that's what the law is. And that's why you're not going to see that in an instruction that it matters at all. It is also not a legal defense that a child has behavioral problems. It's not a legal defense that it was hard. It was difficult. And remember, that's what the defense based their whole case on. Was he's bad. There's something wrong with him. Parents didn't know what else to do. They tried everything. And the, the, she's hammering it right here. It wasn't as easy as the other children. It's not a legal defense that we tried other things. The, there's no justification legal for what happened here. It's also not a legal defense that we did not get good advice. Now, you're going to get uh, the form in the form of the verdict. There's actually three counts, but I just showed two here. Um, and I want to make clear that you make a determination, you just check one of these, but your determination on one charge can be different. So that means that you can find him guilty of one charge and not guilty for another. The evidence applies to all of the charges, but your determination doesn't have to matter. And some people get worried that it's going to be like on TV and the four person's going to have to read it out. That's not how it works in here. The clerk will read it. And this is the kind of the instruction that tells you that law that I just talked about, that a finding of guilty or not guilty as to one crime doesn't have to affect your verdict as to the other. Now, there is one instruction here that we haven't talked about a lot at all, and it's called the principal instruction. And you probably noticed that we have presented evidence of both actions and statements made by Timothy Ferreter and also actions and statements that were done by Tracy Ferreter. And that's because although they're being tried separately, they're both charged. And so that means man, when her trial comes out, good Lord. Cause I know y'all have listened to the audio. If a lot of y'all have been keeping up with the trial, <clears throat> maybe I ought to do a best of audio greatest hits of them being assholes to to the boy. She's just as complicit as is her husband. It's Tim doing this. I mean, at first, at the beginning of the trial, I was kind of having sympathy looking at her face behind him, go, think, trying to read her face, read, you know, get some read into it. I mean, she looked like a little withdrawn, like she, she always looked like she's going to cry or she's real concerned. Man, you start hearing the audio, she's like, well, did you hear your dad or Papa or whatever, she, how she called him? 
And, uh, damn, did you turn the air conditioner on? You know, you, I mean, she is just right there with the bullshit. She's right there with him. I mean, I thought at first, let me get back to that point, that maybe, maybe she was being controlled by him. You know how there's situations in women, uh, there's an abuser in the house and, and they cower and then they, they, and, and they're abused. So they just, you know, they just comply. But she seems like there's no d differentiation in her tone. Her tone is she's a bitch. She's a bitch to him. I don't know. May maybe I'm wrong. You can let me know. I'll shut up. <laughs> means in cases like that, if the defendant helped another person or persons commit or attempt to commit a crime, the defendant is a principal and must be treated as if he had done all the things the other person did. Yep. So they're co-defendants and can be jointly responsible for that action. So you don't have to, in your deliberations, make a separation between who did what. They are I mean, she could have stopped it. She could have called somebody. She could have said, oh, my God, she's lock he's locking him up, and I'm afraid. And, you know, I'm afraid he's going to find out I ratted him out or whatever. She could have did something. But she was in on it. That's what it seems to me. She's in on it. Unless, unless she, they use in her defense, if they go with the direction I kind of was talking about, that she felt in fear of him, so she just went along with it. I don't know if that's even a defense for child abuse. It can't negate what she did, and she never went forward. So that's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to that trial. Acting together in this criminal acts. Now let's talk specifically about the evidence that has been presented. First, you had the testimony of RF, and he testified, and one of the first things that he told you and that I asked him about is how he felt about the treatment by his parents. And he told you that he found that treatment to be dehumanizing. He did not want to live in that structure in the garage, and that the defendant forced him against his will. I asked him, well, what would have happened if you refused to go in the room. And he told you that he would have been physically forced to enter that room. He would have been dragged against his will. He also told you that although he did not spend all time in that room, he did spend large portions of his day confined in that room. He told you that every single night he would be locked into the room without access to a bathroom. That there were large portions of the day where he would be locked in. Occasionally, a time or two, he would return from school, be put in, and be not let out until the next day. Damn. He would eat many of his meals alone in the room, and there was periods, more than once, where he was in the dark during the day. Damn. And, you know, on cross-examination, Ben also told you that, yes, it's true, he can remember the good times. Because their abuse of him wasn't absolute. But what their actions taught him. They taught him that his needs, personal, social, physical, did not matter. Damn. They taught him, they reinforced that he was bad and that the cruel and inhumane treatment is what he deserved. They taught him that it was his fault, that he deserved this treatment. And that was, that was good. I don't know. So far, I think she's just bam, bam, bam on every point, just sinking that ship. I, when we get through this, I'm going to sit through the defense, but I don't know how they're going to combat this. We can still see the impact of those lessons on Ronan today. It was apparent when he testified that those lessons what the defendant's treatment did to him are still there. And we see that those lessons Damn. haven't faded. And we could see that in some of the statements that he made. You could see that despite cruel, inhumane, systemically bad, harmful treatment, despite that, those people, the defendant, are still the only parents that he's ever known, that he still wants to please them. Action, facts, non-evidence, improper argument.
Overruled. For a child. And he- yeah, but she got that in there. I mean, it's true. Even though it's not in evidence, it's it's like a common sense thing. That's the only people the kid ever knew. And most kids who are abused, they they still love their parents unconditionally. That that's what kids do. It's it's an unconditional love. It's an unsaid thing. You heard it from both Dr. Myers and Dr. Rappa. For a child, this type of behavior can be normalized. It's complex. It's confusing to have the people, the only people in the world that you are supposed to love and trust to systemically treat you this way. And so for him, for today, as a 16-year-old, still a child, he needs to call it a mistake and say that they should be forgiven. But that's not what the law is. The law, when we look, I'm sorry, did it again. When we law, when we look, we see that this was a systemic, harmful, cruel action by those people that he loved and he trusted. And under the law, it's something that's called child abuse. Now, in evaluating the testimony, we also have the testimony of his older sister, who is now 17 years old. And so when this was happening, she was about 15, 16 years old for the time in Florida. And in that white box is one of the instructions you got. And it's about evaluating the credibility of witnesses. And in evaluating the credibility, one of the things that we look at is does the witness's testimony agree with the other? So she's going over the, the jury uh listing of 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 what they need to do of the standard of how they come to their um conclusion but this is really good because she's equating the jury instructions to to reliable witness as the sister and it's really good this is really really good other testimony and other evidence in the case miss copley carry the mic I never wanted to be like a pop star, and that's how this makes me feel. <laughs> Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and evidence in the case? It confirms, yes, he was locked in the garage. She confirms the status of the room. She says that he had no other room in the house. Damn. She also says that the defendant is confined to that room for large portions of time in Florida, and that he is punished differently than his sister for the same action. I suspected that the whole time, that he treated uh, that boy different than his own blood children. I suspected it. I bet you guys did too. But she's a reliable witness. This is brutal. She tells us that she was allowed to go to the bathroom. She had a room. She had access. And so did her sister and even the baby. She tells us that at no point did she ever feel that there was any need for her to be protected from her brother, that she was never in fear for him, and that she, he never physically harmed her? There's one incident she can tell us about where he stole from her in Arizona. They're fixing to talk about torture. The defendant's actions towards the victim were normalized in the family. And I know that wow. that was really hard to hear because we did her through closed circuit. But as the judge told you, if you need, if it would help in your deliberations, you can re-listen to her testimony, and you can listen to the audio not from this courtroom, but from the courtroom we were actually in. But there, at the end, on that second day, she, we talked about, did it just, because this action, because this treatment was happening so often, did it become normal? And she said it was. Oh, my God. And she said that at the time, I didn't have a name for what was happening to him, but I do now. And it was abuse. Wow. And then we have the testimony of Dr. Myers, who's an expert witness, a child psychiatrist who is still actively (laughs) treating patients and a professor at Brown University. And he told us that based on his review, that the defendant's actions were malicious, cruel, and sadistic, that they Mm -mm -mm. constitute torture, that there was no legitimate justification for this ever. And the only reason that you do this is to harm someone. He told us that that treatment resulted in psychological harm. 
He told us that it was emotional deprivation, psychological deprivation, and a physical deprivation. And that leads to a psychological impact. It, in those cases, a child, at least to a child that is withdrawn, isolated, depressed, it can lead to suicidal ideation. It can cause existing behaviors to deteriorate. So if you take a child that maybe has some pre-existing trauma, that has behavioral issues, it absolutely under no circumstances will correct or treat any of them. It will only make it worse. Ooh, she told is us that killing it. Will it will stunt psychological and intellectual growth of a child. He told us, and we just had a lot of discussions about reactive attachment disorder and whether or not that is appropriate here. He told us that there are indications that there may be an attachment issue, but that the defendant's actions would increase and exacerbate <clears throat> any attachment issues. That this is the worst thing, worst thing that you can do for a child for attachment issues. He also talked Damn. about post-traumatic stress disorder and told us that the alone is a traumatic event that can be a precursor to post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's what he thinks is happening in this case, because he agrees that there is PTSD apparent here. He told us that even though, even if they're not the original cause, they're not the chicken, they're not the egg, that it would make any symptoms worse. And there's been a lot of discussion about diagnoses and what it is and what caused it. I want to be clear, that does not matter what, a di what diagnosis there is or is appropriate or correct. It is not a legal defense. If a child has reactive attachment disorder, it doesn't mean you get to treat them however you want. Oh my God. What matters here is that there is an indication that the child may have been medically vulnerable because of past trauma. And instead of doing anything productive to assist that child, they did the worst possible thing you could do. Lock him in a box? Now, beyond the direct testimony, the photographs in this case, we have hours of ring camera because the defendant recorded every single moment in that room. And like we said, it's not a continuous stream. It's one-minute videos. I bet he's wishing he didn't do that. Because, damn, that video evidence is damning. Related to action. But we have hours of the treatment, of the confinement, oh, to prove, to corroborate what said, that he was in there alone. You want to take this thing to the next level? Let's do it. Let's do it in four or two. Let's do it in four or two. Let's go. word for Damn. it, that the treatment was extreme, that it was dehumanizing. We have the direct evidence of his actions. This is not a concerned father trying to make a reasonable correction to a behavioral issue. This is a man that is angry. This is a man that has actual malice, that has physical aggression and anger, because we see him put his hands on him, throw him on the bed, put his hands on his neck, scream on him, and then turn out the lights and so his son is in an eight by eight box the area that you're sitting in is bigger than that oh sustain does it matter how big eight feet is yeah use your common sense yeah alone and remember we're looking through a camera that is um has some night vision capabilities Total Overall. told us what it's like to be in there, that when the lights are off, there is no ambient light. There is no window that he's sitting in the pitch dark. It is pitch dark. Have any of y'all ever woke up and there was a thunderstorm outside and, and your power went out? And you're like, oh crap, you're looking for your phone because you can't see nothing in front of your face. Just imagine for a moment being in the pitch dark for over 10 hours 
And that's just think we're adults. Let's just try to put our mindset. It's kind of inconceivable. But he's a kid. It, she's doing a phenomenal job just nailing it. I, I'm, I hope y'all agree. Let me know what you think so far in her testimony here. I mean, she's just hammering it and, and making great strides on this. So let's talk about the application of the evidence to the law. Aggravated child abuse. Malicious means wrongfully, intentionally, and without legal justification. What's in a, establishing or evaluating what is reasonable punishment? Is it corporal punishment? <sighs> Things that are generally accepted as being a corporal punishment. A strike on the hand. Abby, I've oh, got the list. Ooh, with a naughtier or Hitting a child Sorry. on the back of their behind in a direct response as a punishment. Reasonable corporal punishment. This was like punishment for war prisoners is what this man did to this boy. Reasonable punishment does not subject a child to a risk of harm. And it does not cause actual harm like the case here. It is not humiliating, dehumanizing, and cruel. It is proportional and it is limited in duration. So let's talk about the duration here. It's continuous. This is ongoing. And I think that's an important uh, like delineation here, right? This is not a proportional reaction to a behavior, like a discipline or a punishment. He has no other room in the house. There is no other place for him. Every other space is taken up. The parents have a room. Each of his daughters have a room. This has the office. So there is no situation where he conforms his behavior to whatever standards the defendant wants, and then he is out of the structure in the garage. This is his life, continuous, even in the best case scenario. But we know that it was more insidious than that because we look at the duration, January insidious. 6th. He goes in at 8, 10 p.m. That's when they lock up the door for the final time. No more back. I guess January 6th was a bad day, according to the Democrats. Now, it's his day of being locked in this room. Damn. Bathroom, no more glasses of water, certainly no snacks. He's not, the door's not open until 7, 10 in the morning. He's in Damn. there for 11 hours overnight. January 8th, he goes in at 9.39 p.m. January 9th. The door is not open again until 8.35 in the morning, 11 oh, hours. January God. 9th, 8.36 to 7.39. January 10th, 8.36 p.m. until 8.25 a.m., 12 hours. No bathroom, not a drink, not a chance of getting a snack. No way to escape if there is an emergency or a fire. Locked, deadbolted inside. When we look at January 13th, 4.49 p.m. to 6.18 in the morning, 13 hours on a regular basis. And the exhibit that the state showed you, all of the ring videos. That testimony, that timeline right there was brutal. Hammering it. He's in here 10, 13 hours in the pitch black. Boom, boom, boom. The, this is, I don't know, guys. I just thought that was brutal. And she did a fine job of systematically. January 6th, first day, that's it. This is it. Lights are out. You're locked in the room. No more, no more snacks. No more, no more nothing. Are in from that entire time period. But then we showed you hours of videos that showed every event. So him going in. And then the, when they come in again, he gets out. So those are the major blocks, the major events. When they come in, they go in, they out. And those are the numbers that we're talking about. When we look at the total in the day, okay, fine, not just overnight. How much of a 24-hour a day is he in the room? On January 10th, he goes to the bathroom between 7.39 and 7.45 a.m. Or 7.43, so that's when he's let out. He leaves the room at 9.05. He told us he got left around 9 to go to school. And then he returns to the room at 4.59, so after school. And then he leaves the room to go to the bathroom at 5.56 to 6.18 p.m., and then he's in for the rest of the night. 
So the total, if we go 12 a.m. to 12 p.m., is 14 hours and 22 minutes of a 24-hour day, and he went to school. Huge portions of this child's life are alone in this room. Damn. Damn, On that January was 13th, same thing. He goes out for two minutes to go to the bathroom at 7 o'clock in the morning, almost 8. He leaves the room to go to school at 9 o'clock. Back in the room at 4.49. He gets dinner at 7.02 and lights off at 7.26. He's in there for 16 hours, going from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. And he went to school. January. And, she, and then she's also going to uh, cover the, the psychological impact of this. I She's just systematically put it put it in a good picture frame of how his life is and how this has impacted him and the abuse of the parents. If this guy gets found not guilty, holy shit, I, I don't know, man. I don't see how he can, but let's go. 20th, same thing, 643 to 645, leaves the room at 9, back in at 445, this time Good Lord. without the lights on. Good Lord. Dinner at 7 p.m. Now, was this every single day? No, because as we look at January 23rd, he goes, he gets unlocked, he gets released from the he cell his father released. made for him at 9.07 a.m., and he's not back until 7.10 a.m. So, yeah, he's out for most of the day this one day. One day. One day. That doesn't change this, though. Yeah. The psychological impact. And when we look at the proportionality, it's important to remember that the time frame that we are talking about is a cr the crimes that occurred in Florida. And that is from December 2021. And it's a shame that they can't. She can draw from the aspects of Arizona because they, they do have testimony are from I get from the kid the 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 sister and stuff that this abuse was happening in Arizona but he's only being tried for locking this kid up here in Florida but this abuse has been going on for years until January of 2022 you can see the things that he is getting in trouble for on that video he's getting in trouble for stealing candy on that very first night you stole chocolate from us his mom says, having an iPod in his... Oh, my God. So the mom rats him out to the dad? I'm just speculating here, but come on. Oh, you stole chocolate? Oh, shit, you're in trouble now. Like she was she was in on this, guys. His room. Having a bad attitude. Lying. He tells a story about having a mock trial, and that wasn't true. Dr. Myers told us that kids subjected to this type of condition uh, can have a fantasy life because they have nothing else going on, and so they have to have, like, a myth of themselves. What's he going to do when he's in there for 14 hours, 10 hours, 14 hours, in pitch black? He can't even read a damn book. Yeah, he's going to have some crazy-ass imagination. Good Lord. Those are the things in Florida <laughs> that he is being subjected to this type of treatment for. And I want to talk a little bit about intent because there's a lot of discussion from the defense about intent. How do we determine someone's intent? For aggravated child abuse, it has to be that they maliciously punished, willfully tortured, or willfully caged. There's the malicious. Those are intentional actions. We have to prove that the actions that they took were intentional that he intentionally and purposely put him in that room, in that structure. Objection, misstatement of the law. A room. I, I think they they have, just with the testimony of the of the sister, I mean, I hope the jury's paying attention, but in my mind, thinking back, well, the, the, the sister's saying, well, I did some bad things too, some of the same things he was doing, but I was treated differently. I wasn't locked up, but he was, and we did the same things. So, th to me, that laid a ground for, yeah, you intentionally did this to him. That it wasn't an accident. That's the intention. That he willfully tortured. That he maliciously punished. Not every idea that was in his head. So, how do we determine, as a jury, intent? 
we look to the evidence, you can make reasonable inferences from the evidence, and we look to his actions and then the things that he said in those circumstances. So let's look at the defendant's actions that he did not give the victim a room in the house. He hired a contractor specifically to build this. Oh my God. He specified no windows, eight by eight, lights controlled from the outside, lock, and Jeez. a deadbolt from the outside. No bathroom, and he put that bucket in there. This is brutal. So there's the intention, there's the, the, the malice. You hired a contractor to specifically, with specific specs, to build this room as a prison cell with a ring camera. Good Lord. She nailed it. Each one of those steps are intentional, specific, deliberate acts. It's not an accident. That this happened like this we know exactly what he intended to do to his son he set up the room he put the camera in there and then he forced the child to use a bucket this is a screenshot from january 19th at 6 46 a.m where he has to use the bucket he had been in the room since 9 12 p.m the night before oh my god and this happened again and again. And in the morning, on one of the videos, you can hear the defendants tell him to take out the bucket and say, your neighbors don't need to see your piss bucket. From the outside. No, he didn't want the neighbors seeing the kid coming out with a piss bucket that the kid been locked up. No, he did not want the neighbors to see that shit. Inside, everything looked okay. But what was happening inside that room? The abuse. Yeah. Say we the least. see that the defendant's repeated actions to social, socially and physically isolate the child over and over and over again for hours last week. This part coming up, I thought was really, really good. They're going to talk about the air conditioner and he touched it. And listen what the mom says. They're going to play a re ring camera clip, and you can hear the audio pretty good. This week, we watched him alone in his room eating. And Dr. Myers told you about the impact of that type of social and physical isolation. His actions to take away every little step and bit of autonomy that he had, that he had no control over the temperature even in the room. Okay. Did you turn the air on in your room? Yes. You're supposed to touch that? Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, they're in Florida. They're in Florida. Now, it's in January, but still, he's in a garage, in a room, with no windows, no ventilation other than the air conditioner. It's probably a freaking oven in there and smells horrible. Did you hear Baba? Yes. Did you hear his question? No. Are you supposed to touch uh, air conditioning? No. Why did you touch it? It was getting hot. I don't give a shit if it's getting hot. You're a tough guy. You don't touch the air conditioning. I'll deal with you tomorrow on that. You know, an opening statement, defense counsel. Okay, so he's already locked in a room. He's probably in the dark. Somehow, maybe, I don't know, he turns the air on. So he's already being punished because he's in the room with the door lock. He can't get out. He's got a bucket. But he's going to punish, deal with him tomorrow or deal with him later for turning the damn air conditioner on and do you hear the mother i didn't hear no hesitant in her voice the, you know wanting the dad not to be so hard on him it's like she's right there did you hear what he said you turn the air conditioner on that's like that that completely that clip right that just changed my mind that i don't think that she um was uh, 
anyways probably scared of her husband at this point right now I'm, I'm not seeing it maybe evidence will come out later that he controlled her and manipulated her psychologically manipulated her <laughs> who knows said that there was just a design flaw in the room it's not a flaw there are intentional choices this is what he wanted to happen this is what the environment that he intentionally subjected his son to yeah an environment that no reasonable person would think was appropriate or acceptable. And then after they have that conversation, both parents come in and ransack the room again and leave him with even less stuff sitting in the room. We have the defendants. So it's punishment on top of punishment. Actions, his choice that not only would he substantially socially and physically isolate his son but that they had to subject him to hours of sitting in the dark so that that yeah. oh you're so tough you're gonna say yeah you're gonna hold it out yeah that attitude tough guy tough guy what's this here What we have here, I mean, come on. I have a teenager. Now I have an older son. He's grown. He's moved out. He's, he still lives near me though, but he's grown. But I have a, I have another, a second teenager, you know, everybody knows a teenager, whether male or female has an attitude. <laughs> they are know it all little turds sometimes. So this just caught my attention when he, you know, you got an attitude? Well, he's locked in the room? I don't think the kid had an attitude. He probably was scared to death when the man, every time the man walked into the damn room. But we all know the point is I'm trying to make is uh, teenagers have attitude. And, and parents, we just have to suffer through those years. <laughs> it's true. There is anger and derision. We have spite. And we want to cause him harm. That's why you're not trying to address behavior. What you're trying to do is maliciously punish him and make him sit in a dark cell for hours of the day. When we look at... I think she just proved malicious uh, punishment because he, even him saying with the air conditioning unit, he goes, I'll deal with you later on that. But the kid's already being punished. It's just It, it just doesn't stop. This is a few minutes later. So that that attitude? Yeah. Oh, you're so tough. You're going to say, yeah, you're going to hold it out? Yeah, that attitude. Tough guy. Tough guy. What's this here? I don't know why they played that again. That's it? Yeah. Alright. So when we're talking about like the reasonableness of the punishment, like look what he's doing that for there. He has a bad attitude. His 14-year-old son has a bad attitude. And that's why he gets to be locked in a room with no lights, which to talk to excuse me, Dr. Myers told us it's the same as solitary confinement, something that is universally condemned for most humans, but certainly for children, because of the psychological harm that that type of treatment caused. And we can see about how often that type of thing is happening. The camera is installed in the room on January 5th. That's the very first video we watched. And we went through each of these. We see that on January 9th at 8.36 p.m. They're mad at him, he's in the dark. No ambient light, a four by four room. On January 10th at 6.18 to 7.06, again, dark. On January 11th, 4.45 to 8 o'clock at night, and he doesn't get dinner that night because they're mad. Ms. Coakley, pull the mic up because it's a recording <laughs> issue for me. Because they're mad. No dinner. On January 13th, again, 4.49 to 7.02, two and a half hours in the dark in the middle of the day. And then they come in. 
And at 7.55 again for the rest of the night, pitch dark, no ambient light, not a window, 8 by 8. On January 14th, again, 4.49 to 7.02, he is sitting alone in the dark. Like Dr. Meyer. I mean, the torture doesn't stop. And think about this, too. If this was a pet, an animal, you know how everybody's passionate about their animals. Hey, I have a little chihuahua. I've got a cat. She's laying, sleeping right over here on my bed. She might get up and walk across my desk. Sometimes she does that. You know how cats do. But people mistreat pets and everybody goes ballistic. I mean, <laughs> of course, I don't want nobody hurting pets, but this is a human being. I'm surprised. I mean, I know there is a lot of interest in this trial, but not on the scale of Depp and Heard. But I was very interested in this trial just as much as I was interested in her because this is a human being. I don't know. I'm just, you know. If this was an animal, oh, Lord, he, he locked up these animals. I said systemic, ongoing psychological torture of a child. Ongoing. January ongoing. 15th, 504 to 732, two and a half hours more in the dark. On Good January Lord. 19th, 745 p.m., those lights get switched off again. On January 20th, 445 to 551. January 24th at 708 p.m., he's in the dark. And then January 28th is the last day. It's the day that he runs away. Man, this has been so good. I think she has so far, she's doing a brilliant job. The defendant made deliberate, intentional actions. He put his child, a child that he knew was vulnerable because of his early childhood experiences, into this circumstance. Every single night, for periods of time during the day, he locked the door over and over and over again and didn't allow him to even control the temperature. Doesn't it make you wonder why they adopted that boy in the first place? And she had already had a daughter, so she's able to get pregnant and have children. Why did they adopt him? I, I don't... If somebody let me know if I missed something, which is possible because kids, school, sports, you know. Yesterday I had to hurry up with that video and leave to go get him from soccer practice, but <clears throat> um, why, does anybody know why he adopted that boy? I'm still kind of a little baffled by it. And then turn around and just abuse the crap out of him. His only option was to use the bathroom in a bucket, and he had no access to water on multiple occasions. Damn. And then, in evaluating his intent about what he is trying to do in the circumstances, we have what he says. Can I tell me something? Stand up. Can I tell me something? Mm -hmm. Don't tell me what. This is your one chance. Don't look, at my look, look at the mom. Look at her face. Y'all can see her face in there. I, I don't even think she gives a shit. Or she only cares about herself. I don't know. I could be wrong. But you would think, man, if there was compassion, you hearing a child cry, it breaks your heart, right? It, she doesn't seem to be moved at all. I'm like an asshole. You want to tell me something or not? saying that stuff in the background you got just too much stuff in your room you're stealing again she is acerbating her husband she because he, he seems to be the aggressor bitching the kid out being violent with him throwing him in the room but she just right there right there she just threw fuel on the fire 
Now, if she wasn't compliant, complacent with him doing this, she would have kept her mouth shut and just not said a damn word. But no. Oh, you're stealing again? You're doing it. Just piling on. Just piling on. In, in on it. That's my opinion. governing his decisions and that's why we know that it's an intentional act stand up why do you give people shit attitude Fuck that! Don't say I don't know. Why you get a shit attitude? Fuck that! I can't tell you how many times I've said something to my son and he'd go, well, I don't know. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? You're like, okay, I told you not to get into XYZ. Why'd you do it? Should they do the shoulder shrug? They're looking down. And then they go, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's all the time. <laughs> Good Lord. We've all experienced that. Why are you giving a shit attitude? Oh, my God. Answer me. Answer me. Why are you really fucking pissed off? Answer me. Why are you giving a shit attitude? We're in your school today talking to your people to give you a better opportunity. You got a fucking shit attitude. And after this, when he exits the room, he again turns off the light and leaves him locked in the room. And so how does that impact our ability to determine or make a conclusion about what his intent is? Oh. This isn't about getting a productive response or even um, having a proportional type of conversation. This exchange is about him having a bad attitude. Yeah. And you can see, even here, we tries to say, I'm not thinking. That's why I'm having a bad attitude. And there is anger, aggression, physical, the, the specter of physical force, as opposed to having any kind of conversation with the child. And then the response is to not have a conversation with them, not try to do anything that would be useful. Instead, locks him in the dark in an empty cell and puts him, uh, turns the lights off. This Matt. is brutal. This is good. His malice towards the child. Yeah. Now, I want to talk for a second about Arizona, because I know that maybe it can be a little bit confusing. We've had a lot of conversation about things that happened in Arizona and what happened in Florida. The defendant is charged with the conduct that occurred in Florida. And the judge has given you an instruction about how to weigh that conduct and how that can impact your deliberations. And that instruction is that the evidence of those other crimes, wrongs, or acts can be considered for the purpose of pro proving motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or nice. the absence or mistake of accident. So that means that when considering the defendant's intent here, you can take into consideration his actions in Florida. You can take into consideration that this is not just something that he suddenly came to in uh, Florida, that it just happened for 30 days. You can take into consideration that this is something that the defendant had been subjecting his son to for a period of three years. Damn. With, as Dr. Rapper told you, really no improvement, right? Like they and, and really, we don't know how, how was he treating the treating him when he was little how were they treating him now i know the sister could only answer the questions that they were asking her right into into the frame of of what they can do there but 
I mean, was they they being hateful to him when he was five, six, seven, eight? You know, treating him different than the other children? I'm just curious. Now, I know they started having problems with him around eight because we heard testimony on uh, some of his elementary school, but it was all dumb crap. I mean, my kid did dumb crap, too. Acting like a ninja on the playground. He didn't kick anybody, but I get a call from the teacher. Well, other kids told him to stop. They were. Just, I said, well, did he hit anybody? Well, no. But they are just annoyed by it, which it is annoying. Somebody going, hi, yeah, 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 right in your face. He did dumb stuff. The, uh, well, what do we call it? He's got a boy brain. They're dumb. They do dumb stuff. They're boys. But how was he treating them? Inquiring minds want to know. When he was little, before, before, uh, when he went, what, I guess I'm trying to remember, when did they start locking him in a room in Arizona? Was he already like 10? If she's saying this has been going on for three years, and he was 14 when this happened, so he was 10 or 11, right? He was still having the issues that the defendant was uh, concerned about, the bad attitude, stealing the sprinkles. And so, despite the fact that it was not helpful, that it was harmful, he continued to do it. It's an intentional act that he continued to lock his structure, that it's his child in that structure, that there was a bucket, that there was no control over the lights or temperatures, that, that he used physical and social isolation. That this is not just something, oh, oh, let me give it a try. This is something that he had been subjecting his child to for years. Damn. If you take that into consideration, when determining his intent here, that this was his plan, that he wanted to do this, that it was not a mistake. You can also take into consideration the physical abuse that happened in Arizona in evaluating the evidence in this case about what he was doing and what he was intending to do. I told you that there were instances where she could hear the victim screaming while he's being struck in the garage in Arizona. Oh my God. She told you that there was one incident where he grabbed the child by the neck and lifted his feet off the ground and was worried that he might accidentally kill her brother. And then it told you about those incidents too. And the reason, although he's not charged for those incidents here, the reason they matter here in your evaluation of the evidence is because that threat of violence, the fact that the defendant's anger and aggression and grabbing him by the neck like he does in the video of shuffling his arm, of getting up in his face, is not a posturing. That threat of violence is very real, real. and significant. For yeah. And you can see that in the videos. You can see him cower. You can see him stand almost withdrawn. But it influences what the defendant is trying to impose on him with those threats and also his understanding of what can happen if he disobeys. So let's talk for a second about the defense case. They put on some witnesses and for the most part, the first this day witnesses were the defendant's friends with the exception of the teacher. Those friends do not know oh. and never were in Florida. They do not know what was happening when the defendant was alone in a home with his son, and they do not know the type of punishment that he was subjected to. And absolutely none of them have any firsthand knowledge of what happened in Florida because they never came in Florida, they never saw anything, and they do not know. The defense also put on um, a number of videos that we spent the better part of yesterday afternoon watching, Duh. which are times where it was outside the house. And, and it was so ridiculous and a waste of time of the defense. It was insane, all this. They, I think they had, what, two or three witnesses for the defense, and that was it? It was unbelievable. And then all of these videos, they picked out every video of the kid playing, playing outside with the family. <laughs> it was ridiculous. What we see from those videos that we saw yesterday is that for the vast majority of the time in the recording, that the victim is able to conduct himself in a family environment. He plays nicely with his little brother, who seems to very much love him and want to play with him and is following him around and, cry and trying to get him to interact. He is able to behave appropriately with his other siblings. You see him playing with the dog. 
we do not see violence or aggression. You know, there's been kind of this idea floated that we had to keep the family safe. There is no evidence of that. Wow. The evidence is to the contrary. He's toast, man. I mean, burnt toast. <laughs> Damn, this has been brutal. This is the kind of prosecution closing arguments I love to see where they're just systematically nailing and hitting every point. Bring, and then now in this phase, bringing up the defense and their dumbass damn defense. <laughs> I, it's just brilliant. The person that was jeopardizing the safety of the Farrader family was Tim Farrader. Oh, snap. We see that there are periods that he wasn't confined. And we agree with that. I told you about that. When we look at the videos we showed you, we saw some videos of him um, on a scooter, which is on January 7th, 2022, after school. You can see in the videos that the state published that that's the outfit that he puts on. He leaves for school, comes back, he plays on the scooter. And then at 5.42 p.m., he's locked in the cell. And he eats dinner in there alone. And he's in there until he goes to sleep in the room where he cannot leave to get a glass of water or to get a bathroom. Damn. On January 9th, this is a Sunday, 8.45 a.m., the state's evidence is he's let out from the room. Then, like he told you, he was often, when he was outside of the room, having to do yard work. We see him in the defense exhibit moving those mulch. And you see in the defense exhibit, I took a close screenshot, but if you look over, the defendant and his wife are sitting at the table while the child's working. And then later, that same day, there's those videos. Like he told you, one of the things that he had to do was to clean up all the rocks. And the state put into evidence, video after video, of him out there by himself, by hand, taking up the shelves. You see the defendant come take a look and come back and say, every single rock. Damn. So yes, he did get out of the house, and sometimes he got to go on a scooter. Sometimes he had to do yard work, but at 625 every single night or earlier, he's locked in that room. <laughs> the fact that on one day he watched a football game with his dad does not vitiate all the other days of systemic abuse. Wow, no shit. And then we have the testimony of Dr. Rappa. Dr. Rappa is their expert, a psychologist, <laughs> and she told you that the way they chose to manage was probably the worst way that any person can manage these types of behaviors. She told you that the defendant's actions are the complete opposite of what anyone should have done with a child that has one of these conditions. That expert witness for the defense, for the psychology? What the hell? It did nothing but hurt them. Every witness they did have hurt them. Nothing got minimized in that testimony. It was mind-boggling to me how bad it was for the defense. I just thought I'd add that in there because it was bad. She told you that there is a likelihood of psychological harm, even, even in children that had no underlying behavioral issues, that this is going to be harmful to anyone. <laughs> but especially someone like a child. She talked Damn. about PTSD and reactive attachment disorder, and she told you that the defendant's actions would exacerbate the symptoms. That what he did made it worse. Oh my God. Actual harm. That is the defendant's own evidence. She says that this is not the re recommendation that they received from any treatment provider. That she went through the records and that what was recommended was medicine and therapy. And that there was very little of that done. And the last time, the last time that they dealt with any mental health professional for their son who 
according to the defense, they're so concerned about his behavior was in 2019. The time frame that we are talking about is December of 2021 to January of 2022. Two years later. Damn. Bam. No efforts. And we can see, God. and it's in evidence, you can take a look, when he is enrolled in school at the Palm Beach County School District at Independence Middle School in January of 2022, you fill out enrollment paperwork. And there, Tracy Ferreter says, normal dental, normal skin, normal eyes. Any concerns about general health? No. Any other specific illnesses or social or emotional or behavior problems? No. At no point did they try to get an IEP, an individual in, uh, educational plan. At no oh, point snap. after 2019. Action facts not in evidence as to the IEP. Overall. Don't matter. We heard that, you know, they, there was one email sent to someone about transcendental med meditation. 2022. You know what else happened in 2019? Instead of doing anything productive to deal with the trauma may be experienced by their sons or their behavioral issues, they locked him in the garage. How the hell are you going to get a teenager to meditate for Pete's sake? I don't know. Y'all let me know what you think on that, but... I'm just trying to think, yeah, I'm going to get my kid. Hey, come here, honey. We're, I'm going to teach you how to meditate. He'd probably look at me like I'm crazy. He going to run outside and kick the ball around. Damn. Their biological son piece was born. They needed the bedroom and went into the garage. Oh, shit. 2019 is when they stopped with the mental health professionals. In 2019, when that, that is happening. Those actions, what the defendant is taking, is not reasonable punishment meant to correct something. It is malice. It is willful torture. It is intentional case. Damn, that was brutal. Now, Dr. Rappo, there was a discussion about who, what started the PTSD. Was it the defendant's abusive actions or was it just his childhood neglect? And you got an instruction about how you can evaluate a, a witness's testimony. That instruction is that you get to use your common sense in deciding what is the best evidence. You get to decide what should be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence reliable and some not. So you can say that some of what Dr. Rappa said makes sense to me and I think is appropriate in light of the totality of the circumstances. Some of it doesn't really line up. But our expert. I, I don't know. How, well, when you think of Dr. Rappa's uh, testimony, hell, she agreed with the prosecution. This was a bad idea. You locked him in a room for 10, 12, 14 hours a day. She agreed on all of it. Now, the only thing she didn't agree is that the, the, the parents were malice. That's it. Experts agree. Unequivocally. The defendant's actions were harmful. They should never have occurred. And they would have led to worse behavior for the victim. That there was absolutely no benefit to what they did. Instead, they were harmful. In a criminal case, the state's burden is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the law instructs us on what a reasonable doubt is. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative or imaginary doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty. And so what does that mean? If you're back there in the jury room and you find yourself speculating, well, this is what they could have meant. And it's not based on evidence, it's speculation. The law is that you have to stop. If you find yourself forcing a doubt or imagining a doubt, the law is you have to stop. A verdict of not guilty can only be based on a doubt that is reasonable. And when we look at the totality of the evidence in this case, there are no reasonable Centella. doubts left.
Now, one of the instructions that Judge Coach just gave you is what the lawyers say is not evidence, and you should not consider it as such. The exhibits, the testimony, the video recordings, that is not, that is evidence. What I say and what the defense says is not evidence. Her explaining it was good, good to me. It sounded good. You get to use your common sense. Every single day in courtrooms around the country, we convene ordinary people, and we ask them to use their common sense about what is reasonable and about what is appropriate and what evidence is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. He should have took the deal. My guy. My guy. For about six weeks, I was locked in a room in Jupiter, Florida. And yeah, he got to go to school, and sometimes he got to go on a scooter, and sometimes he got to play with the dog. But as you heard from Dr. Meyer, that doesn't change the impact of this type of treatment has on any child. Yeah. But absolutely on a child like the defendant's intentional, repeated acts caused harm. Any person would know, any reasonable parent would know that this is not acceptable. Any reasonable parent or person would know that this is going to harm. And despite that. Now, you parents out there, you know you want to throw your kid in a box. No, I shouldn't make fun. But, no, hear, hear, hear me out. Kids can drive you nuts and make you very angry. But most of us have a stopping mechanism where I'm not going to take the take a a bat and and whack him with it, right? Right. There 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 are certain kind of corporal punishments that you can do, and then at some time when they become teenagers, they're kind of you know they're too old to be giving them a spanking. You just ground them. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is we all know parents out there, children can make you very angry when they do too stupid stuff like getting the can of black spray paint and decide to do some art on the front porch okay that's happened over here yeah it's like why did you get in that black spray paint and it's all over the front porch well not all over but there was a streak of it okay crap like that i mean i'm not gonna throw him in a dead blame cell kids do stupid stuff <laughs> As my nephew says, they have a boy brain. The young people, young teenagers, they still got a boy brain. They do dumb stuff. You just got to deal with it, parents, and y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. We deal with it. Yeah, you take a deep breath. You're like, oh, my God, you got into the spray paint. You know, but these people went to extreme measures. That's the point I was trying to make. Over and over and over again, Tim Ferreter made that intentional, deliberate decision to treat his son like this. Damn. That's actual malice. That's intentional torture. That is willful caging. It's aggravated child abuse. It's child neglect. And it's certainly false imprisonment. I agree. It's not just one thing or one moment. It is all the things over and over and over again. What the defendant did was a crime, and that's why we're here today. Like told you, it was dehumanizing, and it was traumatic, and it should never have been done. Do you think when y'all heard that testimony from Myers that, um, the the mom had claimed that the child never connected with her. You know, I just had a thought just now. Is maybe, yeah, it's like children, I guess children and animals, you know how they say they sense things? Like children recognize other children, they get excited. This kind of thing, they have a sense, a sixth sense, I guess, is uh, trying to, how I can explain this. To where maybe he, the boy sensed that they didn't, they didn't love him. Obviously, if they loved him, 
and really cared for him. Good Lord, if you love him, you're not going to, he didn't throw his own children in there. So that just gave me a thought. It's like, okay, well, why didn't he bond with her? Okay, so you're saying because he had this this reattachment uh, syndrome from, from a child, but he didn't attach with her. They're supposedly a loving family. I, I'm questioning that, I guess, right now. I'm questioning that they, they never showed him genuine love, that he could sense it, right? Y'all get what I'm saying without saying kind of thing? <laughs> Based on all of the evidence, that is why we are asking you, all of that evidence, those hours of tedious videos, and I know it was tedious to watch them, but the reason a lot of video is to see just a moment of what that tedious life was like for here. Based on all of the evidence and based on the laws of the state of Florida, we're asking you for the only verdict that is supported by the evidence and supported by the law. And that is a verdict of guilty. Guilty. Wow. That was good. Now, I'm going to put this link in the description, and then I'm going to do a separate video of the, the defense. And oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'm looking forward to hearing that. But, uh, yeah, just to touch back on that, it just started making, and I don't know why I didn't think this before, is that he probably sensed it even as a small child. They, they didn't really, he didn't feel loved. And maybe this is why he's acting out. She's having a, she has the daughter, she, they adopt him. She goes and has another kid. She's spending her time with the with her own blood children i, I may she just didn't uh i mean i could be reaching here i i don't know but i don't i don't think they they loved him i mean i could i could be completely way off base on this i don't know but it doesn't make sense to me it just doesn't make sense to me that what what they they why and why did they adopt him in the first place? She could have children. They just did this out of the kindness of their heart. I don't know. Some people do stuff just to keep up with the neighbors, keep up with the Joneses. I don't know. Yeah, we're gonna go adopt a kid to make us look good in the community. I don't know. This is all speculation. But anyway, I'm going to stop speculating. This was really good. I'll put the link in the description, and you can watch the whole entire thing if you choose to. It was really, really entertaining and good. Um, I believe uh, if you want to watch the video, her, because when the video starts, they're doing some other things, court, court things. But the prosecution's closing arguments start at one hour, about one hour and 18 minutes, so... If you wanted to just jump in, skip to it, boom, and get, get to her talking. But anyway, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. And, uh, yeah, let me get on to the defense. And have a great day and peace out.